Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 129 of the podcast. This is a podcast interview that I've been waiting to have for a long time. Didn't have a guest in mind until I heard about Craig. Craig Cable is our guest today. We're going to talk about security, which I know may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but you know, far and above, the most uh, important thing to me about this podcast is that it's helpful to you in a very real and practical way that you can listen. It's not just going to maybe change how you might think about something or um, challenge some of your existing thoughts or whatever, but also give you practical tools and handles that you can use in your ministry. And I just know security is really, really important, really, really important to all of us. And sometimes uh, if you're like me, there's a lot of things you wish you knew. There's a lot of expertise you'd l- wish to you could lean in on. And so I have Craig on the podcast today. We talk all about church security, uh, topics like, you know, serving in children's and student ministry with minors and background checks and safety and security policies for that, uh, fostering that culture of safety, safety and security. We talk about dealing with domestic situations. I even throw a couple questions at him that are very specific that I know have come up for us and probably come up for you in your ministry as well. So you're going to love this interview. He gives a lot of resources as well, some links and things that you can get in the show notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 129. Before we jump in, I want to remind you, if you listened last, last week, if you didn't listen last week, I'll let you know for the first time that we have a couple free webinars coming up with Ministry Boost. Uh, one of them is going to be on baby dedication. So that's in just next week. December 6th, 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you serve in children's ministry, preschool ministry, we're going to talk all about baby dedication, the different types, formats, uh, gift ideas, uh, scripts, you know, giveaways, set up, uh, follow up, all of that as it relates to baby dedication. And then we're going to talk volunteer training. So that really doesn't matter what ministry you serve in because this will apply across the board. Uh, We're going to do a webinar, free webinar on that at the turn of the year on January 10th also 1 p.m. Eastern. You can check those out and sign up for those at ministryboost.org slash webinars. Let's go ahead now and jump into my conversation with Craig Cable about church security. Well, today I'm talking with Craig Cable. Welcome to the podcast, Craig. Thank you for having me, Nick. You bet. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, as we get started here. Yeah, I I kind of straddle two worlds. I've been here at Group Publishing for a little over 12 years, and I oversee the development of a variety of different ministry resources from pastor leader to youth ministry to our conferences and events. Um, and I've, as of recent, I uh, started leading uh, the initiative around church safety and security, which is a complement to the background check screening services that Group had been offering for years. That's kind of one one side of my life. The other side of my life is I've been involved in church safety and security as a team leader, tactical trainer uh, for church security teams for over three years. I'm also a board member of the Northern Colorado Christian Security Roundtable, which is a consortium of church security teams from all over Northern Colorado. I also do executive protection bodyguard work for a variety of people, including some celebrities that you'd recognize. Uh, And I'm in the process of going uh, through the academy to become a reserve volunteer sheriff deputy for our county. So uh, a lot of fun stuff. I'm a NRA certified firearms instructor. So I've had a lot of security world uh, experience, but also uh, a lot of ministry experience. And so that's, that's how group really evolved into this topic. So I'm glad that you have all that background. That's why we're talking because I feel like this topic of safety and security is something people want to talk about. It's big. We've not had a guest on the podcast talk about it yet. So I'm really excited that we get to talk about it mm-hmm. now. And there, I mean, it's pretty broad, obviously. So there's a lot of things we could talk about. So we're going to try to hit some questions that, um, will make it practical for people who are listening, children's and student ministry, next gen leaders for the most part. And I'll start with this. What are some of the most common risks? For a church, I mean, so if we start there, what are the big risks that we're talking about? 
Yeah, no, it's a great question, Nick. And I would say, uh, as of when this podcast is being recorded, we've had some recent events. And uh, we just were celebrating the one-year anniversary of the shooting in Sutherland Springs, a small Baptist church in South Texas, where tragically uh, the majority of the congregation was either sh- wounded or killed. Uh, we also recently had the Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, and then uh, on its heels, the uh, shooting in Thousand Oaks, California. So right now, what we're hearing is churches are reacting out of, and it's a, it's a normal reaction. They're afraid. They're hearing these stories of these active shooter events. And so churches are responding to that fear by believing that is their one and only threat. And I'm here to tell you there, there are much more common risks that their churches are facing. And while you need to be prepared for an active shooter, uh, you can't do it at the while overlooking the more common things. Uh, for example, one of your greatest threats in your church this Sunday is probably that welcome mat that uh, as people walk into your church, uh, slips and falls are one of the most common uh, risks that a church will experience that will uh, create injuries and, and some liability for your church. That's, that's one. That's probably one of the bigger ones. Um, we also hear about sexual misconduct, uh, you know, cases where uh, staff or volunteers have, have been involved in uh, misconduct with children and youth. That's another one. Uh, your church is more than likely going to encounter something around a theft or a burglary, burglary or vandalism. That's uh, that's also it. But I would say the one that most churches are not fully prepared for um, are medical incidents. Uh, as our congregations are getting older, um, they're more prone to a cardiac arrest or stroke or um, people fainting. Uh, those are all real viable risks to your church. And I'm finding that uh, there's not a lot of preparation or thought or planning around how to mitigate to the best of your ability those risks. I was talking with somebody today, a children's ministry leader in another church, even just about the idea of they, they, their staff had done an active shooter training, um, mm-hmm. Alice, which a lot of people are familiar with, sure. through the county police. But we were just talking about how even like a fire drill for children's ministry, it's just like, you know, not a lot of churches are doing that. And you just listed a bunch of things that it's a lot, you know, and if you're a larger church, maybe there's somebody who's staff dedicated to this. And so therefore maybe more of this is happening. But if you're the average church, you know, 98% of churches or whatever under a thousand, there's, there's just a lot. So whose job is safety and security, especially if your church isn't large enough that it actually is somebody's whole job. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's going to sound a little cliche and we say that, okay, everyone plays a role in your church's safety and security and we want to instill a culture of safety and security. What I actually find, and this is, this is whether or not it's a small church, medium church and large church, and I train church security teams from all around the country is, uh, it has a tendency to be siloed and that's, that's the problem that they all, there are people who are stepping up and taking responsibility for it, but there's oftentimes not an integration of, of having a common an approach. And so the, your children's volunteers will say, okay, here's what we're doing uh, with an evacuation for the kids, but that hasn't been communicated to any other volunteers in the church because they're making decisions independent of the rest of the church. Um, the same would be said for lockdown procedures uh, where the pastor may have an idea on what that's going to look like, but that hasn't been communicated to all of the volunteers in children's ministry. So they have a tendency to be a little siloed in their thinking and definitely siloed in their communications and training. So that's huge. What do you think in terms of like the church that doesn't have the staff person? Do you still think there needs to be one person kind of like the buck stops here? I'm making sure we're on the same page because, again, it feels like it may not happen. You know, we may not collaborate. I see a huge difference between a church that has a plan and it all starts with leadership. You know, we, we, we often talk about that, that your success rises on and falls on uh, the involvement and an ownership of leadership that is definitely true of security and safety related issues. And what happens is, and, and you can probably relate to this, Nick, and probably your listeners can as well, is that the tendency is for a pastor to just abdicate it. Say, hey, that's great. I'm, you know, Craig, I'm glad you're passionate about this. I'm glad you have your experience. Go do your thing and uh, and we'll do our thing. And what I'm here to say is that it can't be these mutually exclusive things. You know, the the pastor has to be in on the plan. They have to have ownership and buy-in of, of what, how, how 
are things going to be handled? Because when you're faced with an event and people are, are not clear on what the objective is, especially leadership uh, from the security person or the volunteer, uh, you're going to have a potential issue there. So it starts with leadership. And I think that uh, for it to be successful, regardless of the sign of, this, of the church, it takes an owner, someone to, who steps up and says, I will lead this effort and I will make sure that everyone is on the same page and that I'm reporting uh, back to leadership and I'm representing leadership's concerns in this. And we'll, as we get through some of the other questions in the podcast, you're going to see how important this is. Um, that's, that's one. And if you, maybe one other thing, too, uh, going back to the sexual misconduct is that uh, when it goes to whose job is that, it's everyone's job, right? I mean, we hear the term see something, say something. But what I actually find is in the context of ministry, Christians have, uh, and, and this isn't a bad thing, it's, it's a wonderful trait, is that we have a tendency to give people the benefit of the doubt. And so it's oftentimes... People will see something that's concerning, and then they'll rationalize themselves out of reporting uh, because ah, that may just be Joe being Joe. Um, I probably saw some – maybe it wasn't what I saw. It's probably harmless, and you'd be surprised how long uh, incidences can be protracted out simply because people who were seeing it um, – just didn't feel comfortable or confident in what they saw. And then, uh, unfortunately, the issue goes unreported. So it's everyone, everyone's job. Yep, definitely. What are, and that, I mean, that's a, an example right there of, of a specific thing. And I even know insurance companies lately, especially with what's happened in Pennsylvania and the Catholic Church, that even insurance companies are ratcheting up their requirements you know, forcing churches, if they already, already have certain requirements, uh, they're, you know, bringing that up to speed even more. But what are some specific things, almost like you put on a list, that every church should have in place in terms of their children's and student ministry specifically? You bet. Well, uh Every church that I talk to is hungry for volunteers. I mean, I've never run into a church that says, wow, we have so many volunteers. We just don't know what to do with them all, you know. Um, and But so the tendency is because we're short on volunteers, we take any volunteer as quickly as we can. And, and one uh, thing I really encourage is that there be a waiting period, at least six months uh, for volunteers who want to serve in children's or youth ministry. Uh gives you a chance to see them at, at, at your church. You get a chance to see how often they attend and how engaged they are in the cult community of your church, um, but also you get a chance to uh, give a kind of a cooling period to if someone is targeting your church and they have a, a bad intent that they would potentially leave and, and, uh, and, and not um, become entrenched in your church. And so a six-month waiting period would be one right off top. I, I would consider that. Uh, another one is, uh, and this is, we saw about five or six years ago, this wasn't so commonplace, but thank goodness it is more commonplace now, is the background screening for volunteers. That more and more churches, in fact, I think based on our latest study, somewhere around 75 to 80 percent of the churches we polled have some background screening process for their volunteers. The challenge I run into is that they're not screening all of their volunteers. They're only screening some staff or uh, some volunteers, and what I'm finding is, is they're not rescreening in any in any frequency. Yeah. So we recommend rescreening if you can annually. It's a, it's a great thing, or at least biannually. Things happen uh, over time, and uh, and if you're this person's a volunteer in perpetuity, and that's never being checked again, then you're probably setting yourself up for some risk. That's that's another one. Um, would you like me just to keep sharing some more? Or would you like to respond to either of those? Yeah, I was just thinking about the um, re-screening thing. Mm -hmm. The part of it too is you have to budget for that, right? Because like every screening process, I know if you're going to you're going to pay some money, you guys provide a service for that too. Mm -hmm. So like in our case, we know every year we're budgeting this much amount, not just for new volunteers, but actually most of it is re-screening existing volunteers, and that's something that I know I think a lot of churches maybe don't think about. They think about doing it the one time. Yeah, and so let's let's talk about that. I mean, the cost, let's say, to rescreen a volunteer is let's say fifteen dollars, and they range anywhere from twelve to sixteen to eighteen dollars. But let's say fifteen dollars, and you think, okay, wow, that's a that's an investment to the church, and no doubt that is. But when you think about the insurance of having some, you know, and and screening doesn't 
uh, won't show everything, obviously. It's, it's a step of many steps. But uh, when you look at the cost versus the risk of, of allowing someone in your ministry, one of the challenges I often ask is, what's, what's it worth that to allow someone to hurt your children? What's it worth to, uh, to save a child's innocence? What's that worth? And so when you start putting in that context, it's a pretty minimal investment for a, a really a long-term uh, benefit for the church yeah. and, and for your families there. How about the six-month thing? I think is one of the things that's becoming more uh, of a requirement, at least from the insurance company side. And again, I know some that have said in light of what's happened in Pennsylvania, now that's a, a firm policy of theirs where maybe it wasn't before. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously the reason why makes sense, you listed that. you know. And I've wondered too, it probably doesn't exist, but it always, I always wondered – is there, and maybe we don't even have this, but is there information that has shown us that that's helpful too? That the, you know, the average, because a lot of times the stories I hear of when abuse does happen, it's not somebody that's been there for less than six months. Um, it's right. kind of like the story you said of somebody that gets the benefit of the doubt or, or, or they just, you just never knew, you know, they've been there for a long time and yep. nobody knew anything. I mean, it's just totally out of the blue surprise. Is the six month thing more just about, hey, take the time to make sure. It's not yeah. a predator who's specifically coming there with that purpose, or is it backed because hey, statistically, you know, they're more likely to have been there, you know, less than six months. I, you're 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 exactly right. Is uh, oftentimes it's someone who's fairly entrenched in our culture and community of our church, and so they're acting in that. But you also hear stories of where someone has been outed at a church, or it's been suspected at a church. They leave that church and then they just go find another church in another community and plug in. Mm-hmm. And so I, it's a both and. Um, you, it's it's a it's one of many steps you can take, but it's just a good rule of thumb just to avoid someone who is specifically targeting churches or moving from church to church uh, when any suspicion gets uh, it comes up, and then they just relocate and, and find another spot. Yeah, and that's obviously the key is that multiple filters help catch multiple different right. scenarios. That's the idea. Is that there's no one. It reminds me of uh, years ago when I was working for a government contractor. I had to get a, a clearance with the government and had to do the polygraph, like all that stuff. And they would straight they'd straight up tell you polygraph is not that reliable it's the combination of that plus background check plus multiple interviews plus this plus the whole process you know that's right that's what gets them to the point where they feel comfortable giving somebody a clearance so what are some other things some other specific things Sure. Uh, you know, you, you hear this all the time, the two adult rule at the church. But what I, I find that churches uh, comply with the two adult rule, meaning that if a child is going to go, you know, that no child is left alone with a single adult. There's always two adults where I find that rule being broken oftentimes is uh, offsite. So it's a youth group going someplace or uh, the kids are offsite or, you know, you know maybe even at a VBS, you know, where that line gets blurred a little bit where it's just, ah, it's not convenient. We don't have enough volunteers. It'll be okay. I I just, I'm a firm believer and that's a, that's a strong rule that needs to be uh, complied with. And it's a good, uh, um, not only a good rule of thumb, but it's a good practice to continue to instill that, Hey, this is just the expectation when you serve at our church, it's the two adult rule. So that's one. Uh, another I is see it before yeah. you jump to the next. I even sure. see it as pra- as practical and specific as when kids have to go to the bathroom. You might have two volunteers yes. in the room, but if one takes them to the bathroom and it's just one, right now that that problem has come up again. So you need a different plan for that. And, and I know people are probably listening, saying, "Wow, that's just overly cautious." Um, you know, I, and to me, it's not only the protection of the child, but it's a protection of the volunteer worker. So that if an accusation, an unfounded accusation comes, um, there, it's beyond reproach. They, it's, it protects both. And so I, I, I think it's just, you can look at it and say, what, what's in the best interest of, of our church, uh, from a practice standpoint? Yeah. What else? Um, consistent child check in, check out. I, uh, I visit a lot of churches and I would say all churches have a, a, a good child check in, check out, at least a procedure. Where I find though is there's inconsistencies in how one volunteer manages it and another. Uh, and so as a, 
as a director of a children's ministry, if you're listening to this, is just to make sure that everyone understands that um, the temptation is to say, oh, well, they kind of know him, or, oh, that person recognizes this person. And I see that even at our own church, is that, well, you know, grandma comes and grandma goes to pick up little Johnny, and then little Johnny's like, yeah, that's grandma. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go with grandma. Oh, well, okay, well, little Johnny's vouched. Um, the problem is, is that mom and dad didn't vouch. And uh, we've had situations even at our church where uh, the concern was uh, a grandparent that did not have visitation and was forbidden having contact, and they attempted to make contact. So um, the rules in place and, and the child check-in and check-out procedure is that the person who drops the child off, who has the ticket, um, is the one who picks them up. Yeah, well, that happened to my church growing up, I remember when. Again, smaller church, 400 people. Most people knew each other. But there was an incident where parents were being separated. One parent had custody for whatever reasons. But the other parent did uh, was able to pick up the their, their child because, again, nobody – and it was kind of both sides' fault. It's not like the other parent had communicated what they needed to to yeah. say they're not allowed to pick up. You know what I mean? And it, you know, this is a long time ago. There just weren't those kind of checkout policies in place there. It was really much like, oh, we know everybody. And so – that's and we'll, it. We even do that at our church. It's like, yeah, if we know you, we still need the tag because yep. there's other people behind you in line who, you know, we don't know and it can't look like it's just for them or. That's right. Know, or whatever. That's good. You're exactly right. Um, the, the last one I would give is, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about this concern over a non-custodial parent trying to pick a child up. Um, what I find is, is that that's a, a your child check-in and check-out procedures are to prevent that, but yet a team hasn't, a, a volunteer group hasn't talked about what would we do should the situation arise where we do have someone who's trying to take the child? What, what's our plan for that? And, and that's, I, I find that we have one side of the coin, but we haven't fully thought through, okay, what's the next step should that incident occur? And, we, and we'll talk a little bit about what should you do yeah, yeah. Uh, should that it's own it. Let's just go right to that because I do want to yeah. hear what you think is recommended there. I do think that puts people in a tough spot because you're like, okay, wait a minute. If I do, do I not let them take the child? What if how? What if they get forceful with that? At yeah. What point is this like? Especially if they are in some ways a legal guardian, but you know, it just gets messy, right? Because like you could be in the midst of some kind of parents could be in the midst of some kind of legal battle where custody and all that stuff isn't quite determined or it is and not communicated. So how like how can churches prepare themselves for those kinds of domestic type situations? Yeah. Well, the the first is to recognize the volatility of the situation. Um, it's it, when you look at a domestic situation, the reason they're so volatile is because they're often e highly emotionally charged. That's the issue. Um, it's not someone just walking in and, and uh, you know, the, and, and for the most part, it's not someone who's just a stranger who's going to kidnap a child. This person has a has a relationship with this child. And so all of that backstory, all of that history, all of that dysfunction is wrapped into this interaction. And so that that's why it's so emotionally charged. And, and so you often hear this is that the most dangerous call a police officer will respond to is a domestic disturbance. And so when you when you look at it, just for example, in 2017 alone, there were more officers were shot responding to domestic violence than any other type of firearm related fatality, according to the National uh, Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. I mean, you really think about that. Uh, yeah, give you more some than drugs more than more than drugs yeah. that's right yeah so you, you think of you know here you're going into this you know drug dealer who's protecting his livelihood and his drugs and he's armed nope the that's while dangerous it is uh, far more officers are killed responding to a family disturbance uh, where there's a firearm in the home and it's because it's so emotionally charged so you you look at the volatility of the uh, of the situation based on the emotions. Then you also look at the rate of uh, protection orders or uh, restraining orders, as depending upon the state you live in. Um, they I found a study back in 2008 that showed that courts had issued around 1.7 million domestic violence restraining orders that year. And so back in 2008, I imagine it's either the same or if not, it has possibly grown, is that there's at any given time, there's 1.2 million domestic violence restraining orders that are currently active. So when you just look at that number, if you think your church is immune to that or, or exempt from that, just the sheer number uh, 
makes it highly likely that someone in your church is dealing with or has has a protection order oftentimes in place, and your church may not be aware of it. Um, you may be aware of it, and then ill prepared on how to how to handle it. So that those are that's the risks, that's the volatility of the situation, and how common that is. We're aware of about two or three right now. I don't know if the third one is as um, oftentimes they'll put a protection order in place pending a court appearance, but uh, we're we're aware of a few right now that are things for us to keep an eye out as a security team. Mm-hmm. How do you? What are what are the best ways to deal with that? I mean, of course, there's different aspects of it too. It's not just one problem, but. What are the right. best ways to deal with the issues that stem from a domestic situation? Uh, first is, boy, get a plan together before you're caught in the situation. Um, uh, you, you hear this adage: "Is the mind won't go where the body hasn't, or the body won't go where the mind hasn't already been." Um, and so, if you haven't talked about or thought through, if you're faced with that situation, what you're going to do, you typically won't rise to the occasion under that stress. Um, and so, have a plan in place. Know what you're going to do. I also find that uh, children's ministry especially invites opportunities for teenagers to serve in their ministry, checking kids in and and, and helping. Uh, and that's wonderful. We want them volunteering. But imagine how intimidating that would be to have a parent who's who's not supposed to have access encounter the first person who's going to challenge them, and it's a teenager. Um, it'd be very easy for them to just, you know, retreat and uh, or concede and uh, and not oppose this individual. And so it'd be thinking through where will this interaction occur and who's going to likely be involved in that interaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of adult volunteers who would not do well in that situation. Exactly. I think the majority it, probably of the adult volunteers yep. would not do well in a situation where they have to stand their ground. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, so even even think let's let's talk about this standing your ground. Oftentimes, for convenience, we locate the child check in and check out. Uh, in some cases, at the door of the children's ministry room, or worse, in the room. And so you already have this parent in the room with the kids, and you're going to now challenge them and tell them no. And so I, I, I challenge, and, and really in my trainings, when we do trainings around the country, I tell them, okay. Push that interaction out as far as you can. What's the most, what's the furthest way spot that you can have this, this contact with this individual that still gives you the ability to retreat, the ability to lock down, the ability to respond? And uh, you'd be surprised uh, as people are listening to this, they're going to evaluate their space and say, wow, if we're going to have a fight here, it's bad because kids are going to be around that. And so start to move your security presence uh, out further than than it may be currently located. So that's an important one. Yeah, that's good, even for a church, because I know a lot of churches love to have whole sections of the building for children's ministry, especially, uh, that are kind of locked down, restricted access. And even student ministry, a lot of times, might happen separate. You know, it might be on Sunday night, and so then they're securing even more, which is great. But if you don't have that you're saying check in at least as much as you can don't keep it close to the doors if, if possible yeah and and if you can't avoid that then have a plan for in place and uh, and how you would manage that uh, you know it, obviously we can't reconstruct our churches uh, but be thinking through hey if this was going to happen right here what would i do and what would be the risk to the kids if if this situation deteriorated um okay. And so that begs the question then, okay, if the situation deteriorated, who's going to handle it? Um, and as you indicated, most volunteers um, uh, aren't used to confrontation like that. Yeah. And so how do you de-escalate that? Yeah, and they're looking for – I mean they're probably wishing a staff person was around. But in most children's ministries, there might be one staff person for every 30 or more volunteers. So Right, right. It's just good they're not around. And that's something I've thought about even as you're talking through all these things that I think most leaders are probably thinking about too – which is how do we train volunteers? Because we talked, we didn't even hit all the areas, but everything from active shooter to domestic to fire drill to just normal safety and health. And, and it's just, I know if most ministry leaders feel like I could feel, if you start really talking about all those and you don't have anything in place or, you know, you don't love what you have in place, there's that sense of it's just overwhelming. Like, how do I, I it's hard for me to even get my arms around it. How do I get volunteers? So, but you've worked with churches, so, and you probably do this at your church too. What are some ideas or practices we can use to help help get our volunteers trained in in all of this? Yeah, I move it past theory into application. 
uh, you know, theoretically, you'd say, okay, well, if something was to happen, we would call security over. We would call the police. And what they're, what they're saying they'll do will be very different than what they'll actually do under stress. And so I really encourage some scenario-based training where you incorporate some of those de-escalation techniques. Create a scenario where you're actually managing the situation in the space where you are likely to occur. For example, uh, let's say you go, okay, we're going to call security uh, if if we run into the situation. How would you call them? Are they monitoring the radio? Do you have a radio handy? Uh, are there radios in the room? Um, when they respond, how are you going to lock down and and move it past just talking about it, but actually walk through the incident with this team? And because it's much better to find. Uh, flaws in your plan uh, through a scenario before you you unfortunately encounter them uh, in the actual incident. So it's better to find those issues first and then train around and, and improve your process around it. Now, granted, you can't prepare for every situation. It's going to be very fluid, but but it, to at least have gone through the motions of it, you're going to find what you're going to instill in your volunteers is their ability to not only problem solve, but they're going to have more confidence solving that problem. So scenario training makes a big difference. Um, another one is be comfortable having conversations with parents about potential domestic concerns. I run into this too, is that <clears throat> we try not to be rude. We sense that there's something up and we just don't bridge that conversation with the parent. And, and it's embarrassing for the parent if they have a, you know, a, an estranged husband or an estranged wife that's a concern. Um, you don't want to air that laundry. But I, if you can create a, a culture with these parents that, hey, if there's ever a concern, I mean, think of how harmless this is. If there's ever a concern that we need to know about, would you please let us know? Would you feel comfortable enough telling us? And that way, because we want to keep, you know, the most important thing for us is to keep your child safe. And if you ever know of a situation that would potentially threaten that or any of the other children here, would you be upfront with us about it? You know, that's a, that's a good rule to communicate to the parents. It gives them permission. Should something come up, they're prepared to uh, address that with you. And then the, I would say the last one is uh, practice evacuation and lockdown drills. Similar to the other scenarios are um, you have it in theory, um, but you haven't actually walked the space. You haven't actually shut the doors, pulled the blinds down and, and determined where would we put the kids. And most often churches haven't actually practiced what would it mean like to get the kids out the door. If there was a fire in here, would we go out another door? Uh, if there was a fire on that side of the building, where would we stage? Um, where's the best place to stage the kids? And I would say the biggest blind spot around evacuation is, is that that's well and good that your ministry volunteers know the plan. But you'd be surprised how many parents don't know the plan. So imagine there's a fire, you're, you know, God forbid there's a fire and you have to evacuate. The parents, without knowing where your child is going to be evacuated to, are going to go where the last place that they saw their child, which is back into the room. <clears throat> so for the safety of the kids and the parents, we encourage just communicating, hey, you know, when, when the, it's a new child coming to our church and it's part of the welcoming into our church is to say, hey, just, you know, we have some processes in place. And should the need ever come to evacuate, here's where we evacuate to. Just so you know, your child won't be in the building. If we if the call for evacuation is, they're going to be across the street on the grass right over here. That way, parents are informed. So it's a very simple thing, but uh, it's an important step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we had to think about a while back. Because, you know, you're as a parent, you come right out of the auditorium and go right to the children's ministry rooms. Whereas that most of those in our church at least have better access outside than, you know, the auditorium does. And so, you know, they could get out faster than the parents, yes. you know, but then the parents would just come to meet them anyway. It would ruin the plan if we weren't on the same page. That's good. Yeah. So, and then obviously, I mean, you kind of touched on it too with like new families telling them how this works. The key is it's sort of like the background checks. You got to do it initially, but then you got to find a way to do it repeatedly. Yeah. Bring it up again, both the training for volunteers, the awareness for parents. It has to keep coming up somehow. Yeah, I, I recommend annual anniversaries. So when your annual anniversary comes up, it's a great time to give a refresher. It's a great time. Hey, you celebrate with the parents. Hey, you've been coming. We met Johnny a year ago, and here's some things that's maybe changed since then. Here's some things that we want you to know about. Um, it doesn't have to be long or complicated, but at least any it's it's a good refresher, um, and annual uh, anniversaries are a good time to kind of make a note of that. Yep. 
So I have a question that we didn't talk about, so I'm throwing it sure. off the cuff here. Sure. And I'll give you some context first, but it's, I didn't even think about it until we were talking through this. One of the common, very specific safety security debates that I see happen, especially like on in Facebook groups in children's ministry, is some churches have a policy that men cannot change diapers, and some mm-hmm. don't. And when that comes up, you'll see it's pretty heated. People on both sides have uh, their reasons. Some folks are, you know... They just can't even understand why would you do that, you know, just mistrust of men or whatever. But then I also know that something like 97% of sexual abuse is is done by men. And yeah. so I can understand from a logical, analytical standpoint why somebody would remove 97% of a risk. So what is your take on that? And I'm sure you see it both ways in churches, but what's your take on that? I, I, I do see it both ways, and, and I, I really subscribe to it's a good rule to uh, to not allow men to do that for the reasons you stated. It's there's a higher statistical average that it's more than likely a male who would be the offender, and uh, and so I think it's just once again uh, a good policy to have in place. I think explaining to the men who are volunteering that this policy isn't an accusation against them, but it's a it's a best practice that if there's ever a concern, the church can demonstrate that they follow these best practices, and this is one of those best practices. So I and I understand that steps on toes, and I I love personally going down to the nursery and watching through the window and watching the 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 little uh, kids playing in the nursery, and and we have wonderful men volunteers in there. And, but they they understand that this is not about them. This is this is a way to be able to serve in the church, and this happens to be one of the requirements of that service. And so it's not personal, uh, but it is a best practice that our church subscribes to, and I really recommend other churches subscribe to as well. Yeah, it's good to get your input on that. I mean, I, I again, I get. I know some people in the, they'll debate, and like if somebody brings that up in a Facebook group, you see people talk about. I don't know, almost becomes like an equal rights thing or whatever. Like why should women be the only ones that have to change diapers? But I've never once heard anybody position it that way. It's all about this. It's all about safety, security, removing 97% of a risk. And I get it. I mean, if it was 60%, you know, and it's almost 50-50 chance, well, then okay. But, I mean, it's 97%. It's overwhelmingly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I totally understand. And then, of course, we're talking about – Changing diapers, that's different too than uh, volunteering with uh, kindergarten kids or whatever. But anyway, that's not something I thought about before we recorded, but as we were talking through, I was thinking that is one I see. I mean, it comes up all the time, and, and people are on different different sides of the fence there. So it's helpful to get your input. You Any, anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Um, just w- one last ask is uh, is children's ministry directors and youth ministry folks, be in conversation with your security team. What I find in, is that um, if I ever have a have a question or I'm wondering what's kind of the security concerns in our church, uh, I'll go meet with the, those volunteers. I mean, they have a pulse of what's happening in our church because the families are are really the lifeblood of our church. And so I really make a point of going across the aisle and, and making sure I spend time with these folks. Um, and you, it's a wealth of information for them, but it also makes them a part of our team going back to it's not any one person's job but we do this as a team for them to know that i have their best interest i have the children that they love in their ministry i have their best interest at heart and then it it makes a huge difference so i just want to encourage uh everyone who's listening is to if that isn't being initiated by the security team uh don't be afraid to initiate it on your end and and just offer to meet with and and share insights and perspective with uh hopefully it'll be well received and they'll see the greater value of that conversation the other thing is is that i find that if if there's going to be a catalyst for change in the church around safety and security it starts with the kids um, if it, there is no church in, in America that's going to say, you know what, we're willing to put our kids at risk. Um, it is it is a driving uh, force in the decision of, of the not only the level of security response, but the policies and procedures that the church has. And so uh, you have a lot of voice and say into what's going to happen here. And I would encourage you to exercise that. Be the catalyst for change. If you see areas that you feel can, kids are being unnecessarily uh, – put in in risk situations uh voice it voice that concern and and ask for change that's good how can uh one i want want to ask how can people connect with you if they have any questions but then also i know you all have we talked about the trainings 
I know you have a church security kit, so and an, even like an assessment, like a security assessment. So tell us about a few of those things and how people can connect with you. Sure, uh, I'll. Uh, we've got some links to uh, just some quick little assessments, little ten question little assessments that not only help you assess your safety and security policies and procedures, but it, they're they're informative in because the, they may ask questions you hadn't thought about. And so I think you'll probably provide some links to those assessments. We have one for children's ministry person, youth, and the pastor, three different assessments. Um, as you mentioned, we have this kit. Uh, in partnership with Brotherhood Mutual Insurance Company, we develop the Safe and Secure Church the ministry approach training kit. And this is intended to be a comprehensive view of safety and security for for a church, regardless of size, everywhere from getting leadership on board to building your team to the most common safety and security concerns in children's and youth, uh, all the way to training the church security team around de-escalation, active shooter, medical incidents, et cetera. So it's a comprehensive kit that a church can use ongoing as they're training up and developing new volunteers in their safety and security ministry. So that's a there'll be a link to the kit. Encourage a, your church to take a look at that. That may be a great way to start the new year uh, with some good sound practices. And then if anyone has any questions specific to their church, uh, you can email me at ccable, C-C-A-B-L-E, at group.com, or you can call my direct line, 970-292-4697. Well, that's great. Craig, thanks for coming on the podcast, sharing with us. You know, I mentioned to you how much I've been wanting to talk about this topic, but just haven't, haven't had a guest to talk about that yet. So I appreciate you doing with that, doing that with us and then sharing these resources as well. Thanks. Absolutely. It was my pleasure, Nick. Thanks for having me. Well, like I said, I'd waited for a long time to have an episode about security on the podcast, and that did not disappoint. We got to talk very practically about church security. Hopefully you walked away with some things. Some action items I thought about were uh, listing the things he talked about and using them as maybe an audit for your ministry. What don't you have in place? What stood out to you that he said, it's like, you know what? We don't do that. We should think about that. So use that as an audit and write those things down so that you can pursue that. Another action item would be be to check out those assessments. You can find those in the show notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 129. And you might even be interested in the safe and secure church kit. And and that might be something for you. A third action item I think about is talking about this with your staff because we, and we kind of hit that on the podcast that this really shouldn't fall on one ministry, one staff person. Uh, I really do think if everybody owns it, nobody owns it, but how can somebody own it and you collaborate among staff to make this um, important and make these key decisions and maybe change some things if necessary in your church. So I hope that was helpful to you. I'm glad we finally got to have a podcast about that. I'm sure we'll have another one, you know, down the road. Again, like I said in the intro, if you're interested in the baby dedication webinar or the online or the volunteer training uh, webinars, those are coming up December 6th for the baby dedication one, January 10th for volunteer training. You can sign up for both at ministryboost.org slash webinars. So there you go. Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, sharing the podcast, liking it. Mention it to others, leaving ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. I so appreciate that. Hope it was helpful. Hope you have a great week, and I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.